Many of you who were at our spring symposium heard uh, Nobel Prize winner Silawa Cloutier speak about Inuit people as sentinels at the top of the planet who are warning us of climate change. During the last six months of mine and Cheryl and Jen's conversations, we've also heard from um, Dene folks in the north talking about dwindling caribou herds, elders on Haida Gwaii concerned about salmon stocks, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee people talking about their fights to stay connected to their food systems. And so these are important partners that we are listening to open-heartedly, especially as a team of non-Indigenous people at this point, <clears throat> working to do this work of building health for people and planet. So that's the, that's the map of treaties. I'm inviting you all to see if you saw kind of where you were on it and to um, start to dig into that question a little bit too, if it's not one that you have. Over to Jen now to introduce herself. Hi everyone. Um, just sorting out some of the technical challenges we're having with the interpretation. Please do chat in if there are still any remaining challenges and we can try to sort them out. Um, but really excited to be hosting this conversation. Um, I have been I have a background in community food security and sustainable food systems policy. I'm just so excited about the power of leveraging public institutions and reconnecting food and healthcare systems. And uh, so I was based at Food Secure Canada for the past five years doing this work and recently uh, moved into the co-leadership role here at the foundation with Haley and with the team. So uh, really excited um, to take you into uh, the window into our thinking and circling back to many of you on the, I see that we've talked with you and lots of new and exciting uh, potential partnerships from who we see registered today. So if you just wanna to go to the next slide, um, we wanted to, we're excited to be taking you into this sort of uh, preview of the deep thinking and investigation into the food and health systems we've been doing uh, over the past six months. So this is sort of a snapshot of the many conversations we've been hosting, we've been part of, one-on-one uh, -on -one chats. Um, and we've really clearly heard back a number of priorities, the, the really urgent uh, need to tackle climate, um, the centrality of embedding this work around food in community, um, and you know, the importance also of supporting a community of practice, sharing risk and learning around innovation as the way that we can successfully get to scale and to having the impact that we need to have to create healthy, sustainable and equitable futures. Um, so the evolution of Nourish, we're going to take you uh, through a, a rapid fire sort of portrait of the last several years of work and excited to, to bring one of the innovators who uh, will share a bit of where that journey has taken her um, and into the programming for the coming year. So we've started this work with the central convening question of how might we leverage the power of food and healthcare for the development of sustainable food systems. And our work with the Nourish cohort in particular and the programming deepened that question into how does this work also enhance the health of patients, um, organizations, and communities. And looking to our next five years of work, uh, we are excited to be exploring how food and healthcare can help to find and navigate in really deep and meaningful ways based on relationships and partnerships, the way that we can better connect uh, people and planetary health through food in particular. So as a capsule of our future direction, uh, we wanted to share with you our video of Ode to the Hospital Tray. Take a close look. What do you see? A hospital tray? A platter for meatloaf and jello? The butt of a joke. So I was like, the only thing worse than airplane food is hospital food. Well, I see a platform. I see a way to nourish. A chance to provide comfort three times per day. And a place to honor culture. Do you see a budget line of $7.43 a day? I see 500 million meals and a $4 billion opportunity to reduce food waste, to move the market toward better production, to fight climate change. 
Do you still see a hospital tray? We see a platform for the future of food and healthcare. <laughs> In round two. <laughs> Uh, so that video describes kind of an inflection point as we wrapped up the last three years of work, four years of work, and head into the next. So who you see on the screen here, these are some of the partners that we've been working with for the last few years. And as we mentioned earlier on, NURS sees itself as a um, systems change project. And so the way that we work is always in collaboration. So we have a small core team, but then a big network, big ecosystem of partners, innovators, advisors, allies, people that we coordinate with. And so this is a network that um, we're now in the process of rebuilding for what's next for the years ahead. And following this phase, the next part of our phase, the big emphasis will be on developing these partnerships. Um, so I, I, to continue with some of the thread of what the last few years of work has looked like, most of you know us for our innovator program, working with 26 different innovators who work in food services and procurement, representing 25 different health organizations of different scales from across the country. These very fine, risk-taking, big visioning people have been looking for ways forward to activate the power of food in their organizations to build uh, health for patients, organizations in their communities. And they continue to be leaders in those organizations and they've taught us a lot about how we can achieve the kind of change at scale that we're looking, that we're after. Um, some of the work that they did, in addition to work at their individual hospitals and health authorities and indigenous health centers, was around national collaborative work. And so together they came up with a suite of five projects uh, that you can see here on the screen that they collaborated on. They ranged from things like traditional food programs and work around more sustainable menus, doing work to advance the possibility for more values-based purchasing in this country because we know contracting can be limiting, um, working around food policy innovation at provincial and federal levels, and working to better understand the patient food experience, which is a powerful indicator for us about how we're doing. Um, we see connections between these projects and um, through the work that they were able to do on it and at their organizations. The work of Nourish got recognized in the media many times because I think we were starting to hit on a narrative that really mattered for people. We're kind of tired of accepting this idea that hospital food is bad and that we can just do it at the minimum cost or with a small budget and have it be done with. But actually, we saw a lot of promise uh, with, through the work that the innovators were doing. A lot of that came together in a spring symposium where we shared out the learnings and innovations of that cohort and where we paired chefs, many that you would know, like Joshna Maharaj, with hospitals to work around the idea of developing menus for the future that were reflecting our food values of being patient friendly, planet friendly, and skill friendly, that they could suit the institutional food and the health system of the future. So a lot of momentum has been building over the last few years. So as we said, we've got 26 innovators who are now active and transitioning into more mentoring roles as they scale up their goals or continue work that they're doing. The cohort has been recognized with more than 11 awards. I think this is outdated now. Between media and print from external media sources, more than 30 stories. And we're really glad to say that in, a, in along with the core funding that we started with from the McConnell Foundation, where we were born as an initiative initially, we now have the Errol Foundation coming on as our first next core partner for the work. And this is happening in a time where we feel a lot of urgency. There's a lot of momentum around this work, especially as we think about the 10-year health gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. The fact that the IPCC has called us named that we have a basically 11-year window to address climate change before it gets a uh, runaway. And so we can get pretty theoretical at Nourish, but we really wanted to land it a little bit. So here's a quote from one of the Nourish CEOs. And up in the Yukon, he talks about, Jason Bilski is saying that there are many competing priorities in the complex care system, but food is central to a person's well-being. It breaks down boundaries between the hospital walls, the home, and the greater community. And to speak to us a little bit more about her experience, I'll invite her to unmute herself now, I'm going to introduce the incomparable Jose Lavoie, 
who has in, been an innovator in the Nourish Innovator program for the past few years. Um, elle est innovatrice, chef de service alimentaire au CHU de Saint-Justine, a children's hospital in Montreal. Uh, she's been a powerful voice in the cohort, working in the food system and the health system to use food to reconnect food and health. And she has, although she asked me not to mention it too much, she has won, and with her team, Saint-Justin has won four awards, been on TV multiple times to share about her work. And so over to you, Jose, to talk to us a little bit about your vision in this work. Hello, everyone. Sorry, you cannot see me. Camera problem. Okay. So, uh, why, uh, why it's important for me and for Saint Justin the food is because it's it's as uh, the, the the president said uh, said few minutes ago it's part of life so uh, for us we need to have the um, l'appui you know we need to be sure that the government give us the possibility and uh, the money to give the good food to the employees. So for us in St. Justin, the part of Nourish was, is, and will be a way to be sure that they hear us and they understand more what we need. So for us, what we did to have all those honor is the room service. But Nourish give us the opportunity to think about something else. So we start with the local food, we go after with organic food, and it's just a beginning because St. Justin give us the power to do that change, and they are with us to do something else. So Be With Nourish was for us a good opportunity, and I said to people who are with us right now in the webinar, it's a good way to motivate your team because it's good for patients and for us here we receive a lot of uh, positive uh, uh, words and recognition about that we receive recognition from the external of the hospital but we receive a lot also in the hospital and nourish give us this opportunity so it's what i could say Thank you. merci jose <laughs> uh, so Jose's, many of you have actually had the chance to hear Jose in person or tour her facility at St. Justin, but the work they've done around organic sourcing, working with farmers and room service has had really impressive results in terms of reducing patient waste, increasing, or food waste, increasing patient satisfaction, and they've been able to do it in a way that it actually works really well or for the budget of the organization. So you'll be hearing more from Jose in the future. Um, for now, I think we really just want to set up the fact that what we're sharing is a five-year strategy um, from 2020 to 2024, with the initial core funders of this work being the McConnell Foundation and the Errol Foundation. This is a circle that we want to grow, uh, especially because of the scale of our vision, which is one where we see a future where the health of the people, of people and planet are supported by a healthcare system that centers prevention, equity and sustainability across the continuum of care. So it's a big one. Our team has been doing a bit of work recently to synthesize all of the things that we saw in the cohort and all of the work that we heard happening out in the ecosystem even beyond our own. And we came up with this idea of a map of problems to show how we see different symptoms and root causes of issues that we heard that are all connected to food and well-being, how they relate. And so at the, so you'll recognize within that map kind of feedback loops between things, whether it's waste and climate change or disconnection from food systems and climate change and poor health. And we know at the perimeter on the outside of that map, if we can just go back for a quick second, um, you'll see there the mind, mindsets um, or beliefs that are part of holding the system in place. And behind them, we know that there are values that are often kind of below an iceberg. And so when we look, for example, um, at a paradigm around the idea that food should be cheap or that it's an ancillary to care or that food is just nutrients and not culture, we know that without working from an awareness of, at the paradigm level that what we believe about food, we actually won't be able to um, successfully uh, 
advance health for people or planet um, with if we're only looking at symptoms of those issues. So this map, I'm not going to go into it more today um, because it is something that we're hoping to continue to build out with partners and participants in the future. But it does help paint a picture of how we see different issues being connected. And building on Haley's presentation of that map of problems is the the framing around the urgency of why this work needs to happen right now. Um, inequity is a growing burden on the health system. It's a perennial burden and it is increasing. Um, climate change will have profound impacts on human health, which in turn will uh, lead to further inequality and inequity. So there's a doubling down of these two systems coming together that we see an opportunity for food to lever change. Um, in particular, I think there's a growing recognition across society of the need to look at the climate impact of the way we do our work, the way we organize our society, um, and in particular healthcare, a recent uh, work done by a global network assessed the impact of the whole global healthcare sector. And if you compared it in terms of its impact, it would be the world's, the equivalent of the world's fifth largest emitter on the planet. So it's really an imperative that we look deep into the systems and delivery of care and promoting health in a way that would be preventative um, because ecosystem and human health are interdependent. Um, we also see a lot of opportunity in the interconnected nature of this work um, to be uh, leveraging the sustainable development goals and finding new ways to build equitable, sustainable societies. So our strategy is framed around uh, leveraging impact in three areas. Um, to activate climate leadership through food, to leverage the resources for the healthcare sector towards climate change, uh, addressing and mitigating the impacts of climate, to address the upstream determinants of health through food towards more equity in society, and to support more resilient communities through food. Food is an amazing convener, it's core to culture, Food is medicine and connects us to the land and to nature. So we're very excited about the opportunity of working and deepening these connections. Um, and I think we see a particular opportunity around food because of those, that cultural centrality. Um, so while climate and equity issues are complex and alarming, there are pathways food forward that healthcare can take uh, proactively right now and we see the opportunity of food as a powerful leverage point you know starting from the patient the organization the health and well-being of the staff and patients and visitors to facilities out into the community and out into the world that supports uh, supports life on the planet and uh, to be more concrete we've uh, painted a picture here of where we see some powerful levers um, in looking at food more centrally as a core part of health and healing. Um, uh, so just to pick out a few of this spiral here, this is building on innovations and success from the innovators program and looking into the future um, where there are really opportunities to impact equity, climate and community through food in a myriad of ways. So sustainable menus, um, there's a lot of opportunity to rethink what goes on to the patient tray, where that food is sourced from, what culture does it celebrate and reflect, um, what is the uh, climate impact of the ingredients, how is food served, is choice offered, all of these things come together in a really interconnected way and can be powerful to leave our change. And we uh, are excited to be building up this business case uh, for change and for the impact that food can have on our health care system and re reflexively back onto the food system. Um, so we really see that we're building on momentum of the work of the innovators and other uh, jurisdictions and ecosystem actors. There's a lot of innovation that is happening out there. And we're really excited to be learning more about that, of how we um, need to see food across the continuum of care, how it's connected to health and well-being. So, uh, you know, a concrete example, many of you probably saw in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, recent research coming out about the impact of severe food insecurity on mortality, and it's significant. 
So we really need to be uh, making the connection, um, you know, beyond the hospital walls and the care that gets delivered into, you know, what are all those social and ecological determinants of health um, that our system is, um, you know, uh, currently maybe we have a balance more towards the sickness care and we have an opportunity to shift towards more preventative frames. So one of the things that our team believes is what we work on or how we work is as important as what we work on. And so out of the gates, there are a few principles or ideas that are guiding how we work. And these are things we wanna to continue to elaborate with partners, but I'll go over them briefly now. So the idea of being systems-based is one that we introduced with a map of problems. This idea that we really turn toward and embrace the messy interconnected web of uh, issues, symptoms that hold systems in place, and we're interested in looking for interventions that work at multiple scales and address multiple symptoms at once. Um, it also means that we take a real spirit of um, uh, prototyping and trying things and testing them as we go. Awareness base really gets to the fact that we believe that a system won't shift unless we're working at the level of the paradigm or the beliefs and behaviors of the people in the system itself. And so we work at the level of mindsets, including doing a lot of work around suspending our worldviews, looking through other perspectives, whether um, it's a colleague, a community member, uh, or how you might see something from the perspective of somebody in the future or an ancestor. Play space is really about the fact that you will hardly ever hear Nourish be prescriptive about, for example, something like what healthy food is. That's not something that we think is up for us to decide, but we really believe in leadership from communities and the fact that communities um, have uh, knowledge and wisdom that's connected to place, to their own history, to the ways that they work together. And so we really emphasize collaborative approaches that are place based to problem solving. The last one for now is that we work in a way that's historically informed. So you won't hear us say like, look, just look forward, charge, charge on. But in fact, we really believe in standing still, taking time to listen and look back and learn from our history. You heard this a little bit in our land acknowledgement at the beginning, looking at the colonial history in Canada and what that means, what implications it has for the health of people, indigenous and non-indigenous alike. Um, and I think it's also, a place for us really to work with humility, which we also value as a core belief. So we're going to turn now to what this new program is that we're introducing and this place where this playground for these principles, this way of working that we think is new and is needed for the future. And so we're going to talk a lot, this is a definition that will be useful, about anchor leadership. And so anchor leadership means harnessing the long-term presence, mission, and resources of healthcare institutions, so hospitals, community health centers, health authorities, that anchor well-being in their communities. So this is a term many of you will be familiar with, and for some it's new. Anchor comes um, from work that's happening in Canada and in the US. Um, and it's really this idea of harnessing that big energy, the hiring, the procurement of organizations that have a long-term presence in a community. And so the anchor program itself will roll out over the next five years. And the strategy or implementation of it will have three parts, a learning network, pledge and campaigns that Jen is gonna tell you about next, and then anchor collaborative programming that I'll come back to. And I just wanna note that the work around communications and policy that we've been doing for the past few years is work also that continues and that wraps around this, as do the collaborative projects that the cohort um, has been doing. A lot of these things are initiatives that they started that are bigger and have a life larger and outside of but still connected to Nourish. And so that's work that we see continuing as well. And so you can even hear in that kind of the importance for us of partnerships in growing out this work as it, some of it outgrows us and spins off um, and, um, and as new work emerges. So Jen, over to you uh, for the pledge. Great, so we're really excited to get your feedback on this idea of a pledge, the Nourish Health Pledge for People in, in Planetary Health. And we are excited about this idea as a frame for facilities who are delivering food services or programming um, to commit to action for one year. Um, to uh, identify one of these areas, the Food for Health levers, that they feel 
um, best suited, most excited to explore as an area that they can have for impact. So our vision is for uh, the next slide for a commitment from organizational teams to sign on to the pledge and signifying this in a deep way across their institution. So we're looking for uh, signaling of senior leadership, buy-in and support, having the food service leader who would more than likely, if, there was a, if it was related to food services, be implementing the changes, having a clinical lead, making that important connection into the provision of care and the important role that food plays in healing and recovery, and having a communications lead um, to help share out the uh, learning and goals and progress that a facility would make towards their food for health goal. Um, we're uh, imagining the one year arc of that pledge process to start with a, uh, the team coming together, signing the pledge and making a commitment to explore with their team and with other stakeholders what kind of goal they could set within the first three months. Teams would be supported and uh, linked up with either a peer or a mentor from our, or from our networks. And we would uh, facilitate video conferences for sharing learning and innovations and ideas. And the teams would report back to us on their progress and learning after one year. And then we would uh, hopefully have a restarting and renewal of that cycle again towards a new goal for the coming year. Um, supports for the pledge in addition to the peer mentors and quarterly video, video conferences would be an evolving playbook, uh, case studies, strategies, learning opportunities to help facilities get started and to help bring new ideas into the network. So if you've started an amazing uh, rooftop garden that's engaging uh, youth or other marginalized groups in your community, we want to hear from you and bring that work into our network. Um, and our website would feature the pledge signers, the facilities and their goal, and a simple communications toolkit for sharing that back out within their own um, facility and communication channels. So we're really hoping that we could see a sort of flowering of uh, innovation and sharing of goal setting and working towards those goals uh, across the country through the pledge. And um, we also have a vision for more targeted campaigns for facilities and organizations that are ready to take it to a deeper level of commitment. Um, two campaign ideas that we're really excited about, um, one being the Cool Food uh, Pledge for Delicious Climate Action. This is a global initiative uh, looking across all types of food services, um, but we really love to bring it to Canadian healthcare and looking at, it's a, a system of looking at behavioral economics and nudges and ways to incentivize having more climate friendly menus um, through tracking and, and bringing the ideas of how plant forward diets can be delicious. And the second is um, one that uh, is a continuation of the traditional food collaborative project from the first work of the Nourish Innovators that has been continuing along. And they've been developing a really uh, exciting idea in a prototyping way at the moment to develop an indigenous food waste art project that would bring indigenous wisdom around health and well-being into healthcare. So stay tuned for more about that exciting work to come. Okay. <clears throat> so the next piece of the work, if, if your organization has another level of readiness to move forward in this, will be to participate in an anchor collaborative. So these are going to be place-based teams that are working across um, organizational, community, and policy scales to address food as an upstream determinant of ecological and social health. So they're going to be working together, these collaboratives, and there will be five of them across the country in the first year. We'll be recruiting five in the first year and adding another two, two years in. And they'll be looking to forge new pathways for the healthcare sector to transition towards more preventative, gosh, preventative equitable, and sustainable futures. Um, and so I'm going to take you through what this looks like. So the first part of it is leadership from a hospital or a health authority. And um, in the graphic there, it says hospital, but I wanna emphasize again, because this is feedback that we got strongly, that there can also be a lead health authority. Um, and so 
what this looks like is from the top, a commitment from the organization CEO um, and across departments for the organization basically to get behind this idea of looking for a way uh, to use food as a way to unlock well-being for people and planet. That involves participation of champion physicians, representatives from key departments like food services, procurement, communications, and, co and connections as well to patient and family teams. The next ring is a ring of community partners who are involved not just in consultation, but in active co-design of both framing the problem or the issue that the collaborative wants to be working on and the possible interventions and implementation of those, of those interventions. And then a final ring, which is working at the scale of provincial and territorial governments. And Nourish has already been doing some work as a team to build engagement from provincial and territorial governments. And so as a follow-up with the, from this webinar and the survey that we're going to be asking you to complete, um, we invite you to engage around that question as well. And we're also happy um, to provide feedback where we are already seeing engagement from those governments and look to you for further engagement of governments. Um, and so we work across these th three scales, especially from, you know, as Jose so um, poignantly described and demonstrated through her work in the Innovator Program, unless we see collaboration across these levels and are willing to work um, at a, a policy level with government, we can only get so far. And we're really looking for these teams to frame up a goal that is a real kind of moonshot that they can work on um, to help show a way forward for a new way of working um, that is more preventative, more equitable, more sustainable. And so the, these teams, the five of them across the country, will be networked through the participation in Nourish and the cohort program um, to take action on their shared understanding of the complex and interconnected factors that build health for people and for planets. So again, you're seeing these leverage points, those turquoise circles in the middle and how they connect to the different impact areas. And we have been pushed a, um, a bit to describe what kind of projects we think are we want to see from these anchor collaboratives. Um, and in a way that's really not meant to skirt the question, but with the most humility, our team is really resisting giving an answer because we think that these are going to be ideas, bold ones, um, that emerge from a community's understanding of what's going on and from a, a fairly significant process of actually mapping the issues that they're facing, whether it's like noticing that there's food insecurity in their community that initially they were only recognizing as malnutrition and treating as malnutrition within the hospital walls. Now they want to get to a bigger issue of food insecurity within their communities. The kind of intervention that they might do around that could look like so many different things um, that we don't actually want to be limiting or converging around what that might be at this point. But we do have lots of guideposts in terms of how we move forward. So we started to take stock of what are some of the organizational assets that can be leveraged within these collaboratives towards solving these problems. And you'll see a big list here of economic, social, ecological, et cetera, um, assets that organizations have to use from the procurement budgets, their reputation and influence, the knowledge and wisdom of their patients and staff, their capacity to track and measure and evaluate data, um, or the quality of interventions. And then the fact that we do live in a time where we have inequally, but often abundant access to healthy land, soil, air, water that we wanna maintain. And so these are things that we want to, we see can be deployed for the work of these collaboratives. And there are many others as well. So the objectives for the anchor collaboratives are going to be to activate anchor leadership from public organizations in the health sector. So we really need to see a hospital or health authority own the work to move it forward. We wanna nurture and grow the system leadership of practice of healthcare leaders. So this is going to be a break from traditional way that healthcare has worked in, in uh, the dominant way that healthcare has worked for the last while and we're asking for more stretch systems analysis of what's going on. And we see that happening in places all over, but we're really looking for to build whole collaborative teams around that kind of thinking. So those teams will be identifying innovations and again, developing transition practices and pathways that others can follow and that will be shared through the pledging process and programming. And then also catalyzing resources for place-based place investment in transition. So really looking to tap into the resources at the community level <clears throat> and around the collaboratives. 
So the process for these collaboratives will be about a two year process with the second cohort joining two years in. <clears throat> and they'll go through a kind of rough profit process that you see described on this screen, probably more than once going through the cycle, but starting with building readiness, spending a fair bit of time in problem framing. Um, as a, a systemic design intervention, we draw a lot from <clears throat> what we can learn from human-centered design, the idea of really sitting with and having, um, understanding the perspectives of users and having them be the designers of solutions. So this idea of nothing for us without us, meeting a systems lens where <clears throat> we're bringing together many actors to really um, uh, lean into some of the compl complex roots of problems that we see in communities. <laughs> then going to a phase of visioning, and this is where we're really trying to bust out of our status quo dreams for the future and really look for something that's quite ambitious. And from there, pathfinding. So what are the pathways forward <clears throat> that work, um, that build health for people and planet? <clears throat> and from there, based on what we've learned, which the learning will be constant, um, a, phase, a specific phase around evaluation and refining, refining interventions so that we can share them out and spread the useful ones. So this is like a rough overview of a process that will span two years and will probably cycle through many times. The supports that will go to these collaboratives <clears throat> um, are many and still being designed and will be co-designed and co-delivered by our team, the network of partners, advisors, teachers, consultants, collaborators, elders that we work with, will be around building awareness-based leadership, <clears throat> supporting in a community of practice um, uh, from peer, so peer mentorship and peer mentorship circles, aspects of land-based learning. Our team has learned and with the cohort and our convening so much from spending time on the land. Uh, there are folks on the call who will remember Flint corn uh, fields in Six Nations to uh, sitting by a waterside and watching squirrels uh, in the Muskokas. And we know that the land has lots to teach. So you'll see both Western and indigenous ideas around approaching problem solving. Lots of place-based, so place-based co-design and actual supports to be running co-design sessions in the collaboratives. Convenings for the whole cohort where everyone comes together rather than just working in their collaboratives. And then the work around storytelling that um, I can say our team does a pretty good job of in part because we have Cheryl on our team who's really amazing at helping us tame some of the wilderness and complexity of things and be able to tell it in a powerful story. So what are we looking for from these anchor collaboratives? So I've, this is again, um, this programming is gonna be launched in the spring. So it's refining. We're really looking for feedback on this. So get your pens out. Um, it's not fixed, um, but we're looking for either a hospital or health authority lead, um, right? Starting with leadership from CEO, physician, uh, kind of food service director, I think like min specs, we would be looking for those leaders at the beginning. We're really um, ready to activate their assets um, towards looking at upstream determinants of health. Um, with them, community partners that are uh, willing to um, partner with the hospitals or health authorities and do this work, and who we would expect their participation would also be, um, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The I think the applications we're looking for will see these partnerships resourced. Come back to that. Um, the next part is provincial or territorial government support or sponsorship for this. This also can take many forms, whether it's policy and regulatory, financial, opening doors. We'll want to see demonstrated place-based uh, funding potential for, for the collaboratives. And so what this is really saying is that when you come to Nourish or you're one of these collaborative projects, what you get is you get this two-year cohort experience. It's kind of like a fellowship but it's more than that. It's a space to co-design, to have access to talented people in the field who are teachers and co-learners. It's a chance to have access and to be involved in policy conversations, um, supports actually uh, to do the fundraising that will be needed for the place-based interventions. And so we'll actually, um, while there will be initial resources uh, to support in the planning phase, we actually see it as a kind of catalytic funding model where the participation in Nourish will be leveraged to secure the support either of hospital foundations, community foundations, other philanthropic partners to be able to do the work at the scale that um, it wants to happen at. 
The last piece is um, one around participation and nourish governance. So again, this like nothing without, for us, without us. And so what we'll actually be designing into the process is that for each selected anchor collaborative, um, they will be invited to have a spot both on the advisory and on the nourish indigenous advisory teams. And so the whole process for this, um, to break it down a little bit, there will be an initial letter of intent phase where uh, collaboratives will have the opportunity to apply for small planning grants to help them build their applications. Um, during that phase of application writing, there will also be a capacity building convening where we'll start to introduce some of the tools, ways of working that we plan to be using in the collaborative to help the teams um, uh, put their applications together, again, working across the whole hospital and community and the um, provincial territorial governments. Um, and um, we'll be looking to see that they really can arrive at a shared understanding of the problem that shows them a, a willingness to work at that kind of like deep systems level, looking not just at symptoms of problems, but root causes of them. Um, and then the deadline for these submissions, the final submissions will not actually be until the fall. So I think there'll be lots of questions for that we can get to in the last third of the presentation. Back to Jen. So we're just in this home stretch here in terms of what information we wanted to present to you. So we just wanted to come back to our core belief in what is the driving force of this work and the strategy and the pieces of it and how they come together? So the learning network, the pledge, the campaigns, and this deep learning and establishing of anchor collaboratives and processes and new ways of working. Um, we've, we feel, we believe, we aspire to do this work with partners um, and engaging with many others who are working in this way of supporting this deeper vision and connection between um, health and well-being that looks at people on the planet. So we think that supporting healthcare leadership in healthcare, or anchor leaderships, pardon me, in healthcare will help to build the evidence um, to establish those innovations, to have them scale, and to enable others to come along and to follow and build credibility for um, the systemic and structural changes that we know also need to happen alongside and to be informed by this deep way of working to uh, establish new practices and to have these changes embedded and led with policy so that we can really deeply position um, all of healthcare. So again, our default of here hospitals, but also health authorities, healthcare organizations, many actors um, can rethink the role of food in their leadership and their assets and their way of working to be um, strong drivers of health for people and the planet. Uh, so just to give you a sense in the bigger picture, so I'll take you from the five-year overview, um, recap the 2020 plan, and then uh, end with a sort of snapshot of what are some of the key dates in the short term. So we're envisioning this strategy rolling out over the next five years. Uh, we're deep in our partnership development and other phases of developing the programming in the next, in the coming months. So very eager and excited to talk with lots of you of what that could look like. And overall, we're envisioning, as Haley mentioned earlier, an anchorative, anchor collaborative cohort. So there would be two cohorts formed uh, coming together over that five year time period punctuating with symposium where we can bring everybody together to share learning and get inspired from work across the country. And um, in terms of our scale, we're aspiring to work with the collaboratives and with the pledge towards an engagement of 250 healthcare facilities, um, making the pledge and working towards food for health goals um, every year. But we see our, our strategy, as Haley said, as being very emergent and really open to responding and leading, creating windows of opportunity. Uh, so a bit of the timeline here, this is sort of to point uh, to the left to right, the pledge, the anchor collaboratives, and then the information events. So um, taking us from now and the next couple of months, um, we're deep into um, developing and fine tuning the elements of the strategy. 
working towards April, uh, an opening of the pledge sign-on, an opening of the Anchor Collaborative application process being supported by convening and the letters of intent and planning grants, um, then leading to a kind of early June announcing of the early pledge signers, um, awarding of the planning grants that lead um, into a summer time frame for the Anchor Collaboratives to have a process of co-design and developing their application and their partnerships, um, and then working towards um, a selection of the cohort in the fall and the first convening. And the pledge would be cycling um, from early June on. It's open at, a, at any time for facilities to sign on. So just to condense that down into something even more concrete, the next slide of our key dates um, will be, we're aiming for a launch, of official launch, this being our preview, launching and opening up the pledge and the, the um, opening of the collaborative application process on April 8th. Um, the key point for that being the, for the applications, being the letters of intent and planning grants, um, being in at the end of May, and then working towards the full applications that are built out at the end of September. Great, so I think we've made this point, um, but just to reiterate it again, just uh, we're really weaving this network of funders, advisors, and partners, and that's a big next chunk of work that's coming leading up to the actual programming launch. Everything you've heard is, um, will be developed, refined, cut, <laughs> improved with partners. So these include philanthropic partners, hospital foundations, um, provincial and territorial partners. We just launched a provincial and territorial design team to help um, in the co-design and have pretty good representation in that. We'll be looking also um, to food organizations, health organizations, ind indigenous organizations, or grassroots community groups and elders value chain partners. Um, and so we're thinking that many of these will be represented within the advisory group, um, probably along with the main advisory. We've also mentioned the fact that our governance structure um, will include an indigenous advisory. Um, we think there will also probably be a business sub council. We've seen a lot of um, interest from the sector, from food service companies and distributors. So we think there will probably be a space as well to be engaging with them um, because we see um, that as one piece of the puzzle. Um, and so again, in the survey that's going out after this, we'll be looking to hear about how you want the, the partnership or engagement to go. So uh, what can happen next? So this survey that's going out after, en anglais, en français, on aimerait avoir vos réponses, vos idées. So share your ideas, responses with us to what you heard today. Um, do go on the newsletter. We get lots of emails as a team saying what's happening and it, we really are hoping people will make sure they're on the newsletter so they get everything because we feel really badly when folks don't get the news. We're also on Twitter and tend to share stuff on there at Nourish Lead. Um, and then feel at your own organizations, please start to have conversations about how you want to be involved, whether it's as a partner or a healthcare organization or community organization that wants to be involved. And don't be shy to reach out to us when you start, when that conversation has developed a little bit, um, to have a chat about what, how, it, how else it could go. Um, some things that are going to be in development from us over the next few months are the, these partnerships, um, both advisories. Um, I am happy to say the Indigenous Advisory already has a really like hardcore, wonderful core because um, a lot of the members of the traditional foods team are continuing on um, in that role, which is evolving, but there is that's still a group that will continue to grow. Um, and then, uh, as I said, the programming for each of the aspects of the strategy that we described today um, will be improved with your feedback. So that was a bit of a marathon. We're only coming in two minutes early uh, for, for, for our set time, which means we have about 32 minutes for questions this afternoon. We know, so take a second, please. Um, before we start answering them, we'll just take a minute of pause to give you a chance to reflect on what you heard and maybe write a question uh, if you need a glass of water. So let's take at least 30 seconds to a minute, just pause, and then we're going to come back and we invite in your questions, you to ask hard questions, curious questions, and of course there's no such thing as a silly one, so go nuts and we're going to get through as many of them as we can. 
And thanks for listening for so long. <laughs>
a period of time that we've agreed upon. So um, that agreement was developed between us with a view to including other foundations and other partners potentially in, in this initiative. It's not supposed to be limited just to us. And, um, you know, we think f uh, foundations with different missions may find part of this really attractive. Maybe not all of it um, um, is, you know, for instance, they may not be focused on ecology, but they're focused on, um, on healthcare or on hospital reform or innovation. So there's all kinds of different reasons. Um, we think that um, this is a, a great opportunity for collaborative co-funding, co-governance of the initiative. And if, if any foundations do indeed want to be part of it, we go through the same process that we really enjoyed going through with the Arrow Foundation, which is um, um, discussing the, the vision um, and, and its specific rollout, um, the financial co contribution that's going to be made over what time. And then we, you know, we go ahead and, and we sign it up and, and get, get a representative of that foundation engaged uh, in, in the wave we've agreed upon. Great. Jen, did you want to take one? That's wonderful, Jim. Uh, there's so many great ones. I'm just scanning through which one should I choose. I want to pick one about the Cool Food Pledge because I think I went pretty rapidly through the campaigns. So that's a question from Peter. Sorry, I can't see your whole name. Uh, his question is, uh, have you considered aligning the Nourish Pledge with WRI's Cool Food Pledge? And the short answer is uh, yes, but. So we're envisioning our pledge to be focused on all the Food for Health levers that was in that, that web diagram. So I think we're excited to um, have facilities set goals around a variety of those levers, including menus, but um, we see a lot of opportunity in linking into uh, initiatives that could address food security, for example, um, that could look to shaping and shifting procurement um, a variety of levers. So, but we are excited and have had some early conversations with Healthcare Without Harm, who have been a partner of the Nourish work for many years, and are excited about exploring what bringing the Cool Food Pledge into Canada would look like. Um, we loved your feedback on a, a number of those ideas. I think we need um, to look very carefully about um, what that means in different regions in Canada and be very sensitive about how this uh, plays out, particularly for Indigenous foodways, to make sure that that is not um, implementing changes that are working against that work. Um, but overall, yes, I think we're excited to look at that opportunity and link in and lever our new Canada Food Guide, which you know has a focus on uh, a shift towards more plant-based protein and it also has some other lovely principles that we see core to this work, encouraging people to be eating less processed food, to cooking and sharing meals with uh, others, to think about the cultural dimensions of food, and in addition to the environmental impact of the ingredients that are on the plate. So, great. Um, the next question I'll go to is from Dr. Kate Mulligan in Ontario, and she's writing that Ontario healthcare providers are going to be preoccupied with developing Ontario health teams over this time period. How might you support or encourage them to participate as anchors or partners? So this is a great question. Um, so we had actually seven Nourish Innovator organizations from Ontario for the past few years. Um, as well, we have been in conversation with a few um, potential anchors in Ontario who are interested in doing this work. Some of them are on the line. Um, I think that um, we, we, we're hoping that we can use the, this period of recruitment and application development to um, uh, uh, figure out kind of where there's readiness, where there are strong partnerships to be able to go forward. I think that there are some jurisdictions where stars are aligning really clearly and there's support kind of across scales for this work, including really strong leadership from provincial or territorial governments to do it, to do the work and um, to be supportive. Um, I think the way that we would encourage them to participate at this point is that in this next recruitment phase, 
I mean, we're all ears and willing to have conversations, strategic conversations about how to develop applications, how to develop channels of communications with different um, provincial and territorial governments or to build relationships with community partners so to be supporting in that work. In some cases, there could be a physician or a CEO who has a better pathway to a health official than we might. In other cases, we might be able to open the door. So I think um, it's, Jen or Jim, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but I think it's this is one of the the advantages of a long recruitment window, which was a really powerful thing in the last four years of Nourish work that we did before the Innovator Program. It really gives space for organizations to develop readiness or teams to develop readiness um, um, to engage in the work, and it means that when we start our own programming, kind of we're starting with a higher bar than if we jump right in. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, I mean, and it, it's, uh, it's a related point, it's just about uh, what we've called the min specs, and um, more specifically that, that idea of government sponsorship. I think it, 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 it kind of dovetails with uh, Haley's answers, is, is that really the vision um, of, uh, of this system change initiative is that this is not just restricted to one um, institution or even one regional health authority, that um, it really does serve as a platform to radiate the experience and opportunity that Nourish promises right across the province or territory. So that's why we're really keen on getting, um, you know, uh, government officials, um, you know, at the highest levels possible involved in uh, an anchor collaborative initiative uh, for, for at the earliest moment and to really signal what kind of support they can bring to this. And as Haley mentioned, that can come in a lot of different forms. Um, but what we would say is that it's wh whatever it is, it's got to be uh, uh, proactive. It can't really be passive. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, whether it be regulatory, whether it be financial, um, whether it be in terms of governance, um, we, we see it being absolutely crucial that um, the, the, the health department, um, maybe the agricultural department, are really engaged in this initiative right from the get-go. So that's, you know, that, that will mean some jurisdictions, um, you know, it'll be really tough to get some jurisdictions involved because this may not be a priority to them. They don't see themselves necessarily in Nourish. But on the other hand, we, you know, through the conversations we've been having and, the, you know, some of the relationships we have at the policy level, we're, we're seeing that there's a, a great deal of interest in this. Um, uh, for, for a variety of different reasons. So exploring that on a, on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis is really what that recruitment phase is really all about uh, from the perspective of government. So there you go. Mm -hmm. And maybe making a link to the, the tough question that Wendy Smith, advisor to Nourish and um, uh, has put to us. Uh, so since this work began, there's been a shift by at least two provinces with another on the way to provincial procurement. Does the nurse team have a plan to engage these provincial authorities and encourage a shift away from the type of scale and cost effectiveness that was traditionally considered value? And I guess that just to add and build on to that deepening of partnerships of really um, you know, often our policy scan that we did in the first couple of years of work made it pretty clear that there still are strong silos between health and agriculture and procurement policy. And there is a lot of opportunities of having uh, a more whole of government approaches um, to looking at the value of food beyond cost. So, um, you know, Wendy's been part of leading up the work of a collaborative project to look at those what are those mechanisms um, that facilities for food buyers can use to lever their food purchasing towards greater sustainability and equity along the value chain? Um, but I think we also ha have to bring that conversation to procurement, to procurement officers, to government officials and others who are thinking about what is best value for public dollars. And that conversation is happening in many other countries. It's bubbling up here in Canada and I think our work is again one of those really concrete ways I think that food can very clearly demonstrate the value, not only in the economic return locally, but in all of the other myriad ways of having a more sustainable food production and more um, bringing in all of the things that are currently really externalized a lot in, in the food system related to 
mm. how food is produced and how it gets um, to the people who end up eating it and what happens at the end of the value chain. So we're really excited, I think, about working with these emerging health authorities that have shifted to this model to see where we can find some synergy. Mm -hmm. So Haley, I don't know if you've heard Jamie Yeah, that. well, maybe just one thing like tying together um, uh, Kate's question and Wendy's. I mean, we are going to make a decision at the end of the day about what provinces or territories we work in because of our own capacity, at least at the beginning. Um, and so I think that um, we, would pro we will ultimately um, spend more of our time, whether it's supporting the collaboratives, engaging um, at different policy levels in those jurisdictions where there's some flow. Like we're really trying to uh, demonstrate kind of these transition pathways and what is possible. And so the way that we've really successfully worked is we work with the willing. We work with <laughs> the visionary um, folks who see the value in this work and who are willing to help develop the business case for it as we go who are humble in their practice, um, who are willing to learn from failures or things that go awry and share those insights, because those are the people in the organizations with that kind of learning culture um, with whom we can actually carve out and show, demonstrate new ways of working. And so if there's a lot of resistance in the partnerships um, don't come together in a particular jurisdiction to do work, then maybe the readiness is not there to work in that jurisdiction. Maybe it'll be part of the second cohort of anchor collaboratives. Maybe there will be a ton of people in Ontario who are participant in the pledge work who are really softening the ground and readying for a, an anchor collaborative in um, 2.0. I live in Ontario. I'd love to see an anchor collaborative on Ontario, but we're really, it will really be judged against um, kind of those min specs however they evolve, um, where there really is uh, readiness. Not to say we'll ignore the provinces or territories where we're not working, because I think you know, there, we've seen a real w willingness from the provincial and territory health, ag, environment officials to get out of their silos and have conversations with us. I think they're excited by it. They're, um, and, and so I, I think it, it, that, yeah, just to add that flavor to those two last responses. Um, there's a question from Joseph LeBlanc that I wanted to get to for, um, and then I, and then Jen, I think, do you want to take one next? There was one from Wayne Miranda that came in a while ago. Um, Joseph asked a question. So Joseph LeBlanc from the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, he's the director of Indigenous Learner Relations, I believe. Um, so he's asking the question about whether hospitals and health authorities are the only eligible anchor institutions. So that's a really interesting question. Um, I just, I chatted him back saying, what do you have in mind? Because I think um, we're open, we're, the, the design is still open. I think we're thinking that those are, would be the leads in these because that's where we see kind of being the highest potential place for transformation to happen. We see really wonderful leadership Oh, Jen, Jen, did you want to say something? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so I think we could we could see other organizations apply as anchors. We imagine some of the anchor collaboratives will apply with more than just a hospital lead. So for example, it might be a lead hospital, a few long-term care homes, maybe there's a university or a college that's interested in being part of the work. Um, I think um, we'll come out with more clarity in April when we actually launch the program programming about what it is. So I would just say, please, in the survey, give us your feedback about what you think could be interesting or powerful, because I think we could be open um, to it being other things. Okay, Joseph is saying he meant Indigenous Affairs. Do you, this, is, this, is an, this is a bigger conversation and an interesting one that I would like to have. So let's pick it up. So can a government agency be part of it? Maybe. <laughs> Certainly, we want to be working across scales. So yeah, let's see, let's see what we can do. Certainly, when I look at that map of the uh, uh, treated and untreated uh, land across the country. I think like there certainly is an intervention point in there somewhere thinking, rethinking our relationship. Yeah, anyways, I'm gonna stop, my, I'm gonna stop myself uh, on that one, but great question. All right. Uh, so I think I'm gonna try and pick up the question and you know, Jim and Haley jump in the question from Wayne. Miranda, um, his question is, to what extent might you be looking at a direct connection between patient and planet as a lever towards well-being, or is that out of the scope for Nourish? Um, I think it's directly in the scope. Um, I think we are really wanting to build out that business case 
And I think there's lots of the, there's lots of layers to that business case. I think what we've seen and learned is the impact of innovations like room service, which can really directly affect the kind of dynamics and costs of how food is playing out in a facility. So offering more choice um, enables uh, changing and sourcing of more sustainable ingredients, reduces food waste, you know, sort of these magical synergies coming together. I think similarly, we see that real opportunity of the health returns uh, for the system in thinking in this new scale of anchor, where um, anchoring assets, changing the way that hospitals buy their food, serve their food, improve access will generate health returns and rippling out into community health, which in turn generates, uh, you know, it, there's a bit of a lag. So this requires a kind of visionary leadership. Um, and I think a lot of study and uh, examining of what those impacts can be. But taking that more robust and systems view, I think we're going to capture a lot that currently is externalized. So, you know, the cost of diet related disease currently gets addressed in a very um, kind of downstream way by our, if you look at our healthcare system as a one unit, but we have the real opportunity to have preventative, uh, support preventative health through food that also will have a climate impact. So again, generating health impacts. So this is sort of the work that we hope to do again with, we keep talking about our partners, but we know lots of um, different organizations are interested in building out these connections and engaging different groups in um, better understanding and better tracking and understanding our impacts so that we can be shifting where our dollars are invested. Totally, totally. I mean, I, I think of uh, the work around malnutrition mm -hmm. and uh, amongst so many other areas that could be the focus of both pledge and collaborative work and the almost immediate impact that can have on the, the well-being of that particular person and the uh, likelihood of that person returning to the health system um, being shrunken uh, quite considerably. We don't have probably as much of that data as we need, um, but you know, just, just in terms of focusing on the power of food, there's just a lot of ways to come at it. And I think the well-being uh, perspective is, is a really good one. In fact, we name it as community well-being as, as really one of the big ones that we're looking at and, and we better, right? Um, so yeah, the, the opportunity in both those pledge and collaborative um, opportunity, um, um, doors, going through the door, those two nearest doors, I think are really quite considerable from this perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to pick up a question from Neil Ritchie, who, if it's the same Neil Ritchie as uh, the new director of the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare, well, not, not so new anymore. Um, so Neil is asking or saying 75% of hospitals are small and rural, less than 100 beds. Will there be any consideration of the needs and constraints of smaller hospitals participating in the program? Good question. So the first thing I want to say is that um, smaller facilities are really exciting places to see innovation happen because often it can happen more quickly. The loops are tighter and faster. It's just more straightforward. And so from our innovator program, we have really example, really wonderful examples. I'm going to throw out, it's a long-term care facility, but Grove Park Home, he, um, you know, those guys did really amazing work getting their whole organization on board with initiatives around their food service, developing gardens, an on-site bee program um, that the residents developed as actually a revenue stream for them that also improved their quality of life and won them a bunch of awards um, locally. Um, and so I think that we will be really excited to see participation from smaller facilities, especially in a couple of ways. So one, I think, is the pledge. As Jen described, the pledge is really um, scoped, what the activities are scoped by the facility itself within kind of guidelines and resources provided by our team and our partners around the impact areas that we'll be working on. So there's really a chance for every organization to tailor their own commitments around the pledge. So that will be a really wonderful place for smaller facilities to engage. Um, I think that they can also be part of Anchor Collaborative. So if there is a, if you're from one of these smaller hospitals or even a long-term care home, call up your colleagues from the hospital or health authority, see if they're interested, like throw your support behind their application. And I think the last thing is that 
There will be a number of um, public, uh, more public facing events, webinars, as we talked, as Jen described, we're, we're planning to have likely a symposium again, um, two years into the Anchor Collaborative Program, maybe another one two years after that. And these will be opportunities for us to kind of grow the circle, open it up and have more people come in as well. So I hope that gives some flavor of ways for smaller facilities to be involved. If if there were kind of specific constraints that you're um, uh, thinking about, I mean, we're also happy to just have a conversation and use your feedback form or a phone call with us as an as a opportunity to tell us a bit more about what you're thinking. Um, and I just I want to squeeze in as much as we can responding to everyone's questions. So one from Sharon Okiwi Hao. Um, Sharon, I believe you participated at the symposium and we met recently in Saskatchewan. So I'm really glad that you were able to join the call today. And your question is about, can I show this presentation to two of my councils? And I'm assuming at the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, thank you. And so thank you for uh, bringing this up and yes, we really do hope that the uh, the slides and the recording and all of the content the new updates We're going to be making on our splash page are for you to use where you can to bring into your networks and conversations um, To be bringing these ideas forward to see how they land and feeding back with us uh, what you hear so definitely uh, Happy for you to do that and looking forward to hearing um, what ideas and commitments and uh, excitement it generates yeah, in general, we tend to have a like really like open source spirit with all of our work. If we're going to send you the slides, if you want to use them in a presentation to talk about the work um, and connections to your own, we love to hear about that happening. Let us know if you are. That's really great. Um, and we got a question yesterday from one of the provincial health officials about resources to support the development of these collaboratives. So in April, I think you can also expect to see from us a version of this deck oh. nope. for building your own collaborative teams. Oh, she did I cut that. Out? Haley. Haley, you just got stuck a bit. Maybe just repeat that again. Um, expect to see from us in April resources to help you build collaborations within your communities or Use the resources. It got stuck again. I think the internet's getting tired. Oh. <laughs> or Zoom is or something. <laughs> I keep freezing. <sighs> well, uh, I guess I just wanted to, um, I, Wendy's big question here, and then I think that we've answered all of them about, uh, you know, making some suggestions to us about engaging more more officially or in exploring partnerships with some of the um, supply chain value chain organizations like Supply Chain Management Association and the Healthcare Supply Chain Association. So I think those are great suggestions. We'll follow up uh, maybe with you to make some introductions to key folks there. I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just one other things to add to. Um, and then I think, um, does it make sense, Cheryl, to turn it over to you to talk about some of the um, communication stuff that's coming out. Okay, so um, there, uh, I, so I, we shouted out to some of the innovators today. Uh, we could shout out about all of them, but we restrain ourselves. You can go on the website and learn more about the projects that they were doing, at least for now. You can still find their information, and we will be writing up more case studies about their work and what we learned about transition pathways from them ahead. Um, but on that note, yeah, I'll pass it over to Cheryl. Thanks, Haley. I just wanted to note um, for everyone as well that our website is now updated. Um, it's certainly in an iterative phase, but a lot of the information that's shared around the program, including the timelines, our kind of um, proposal for the specifications um, and process for both the pledge and the anchor collaboratives, and also some of um, our case for why this work should be pursued and could be pursued by healthcare is up on our website. So if you want to look at a more kind of detailed, comprehensive um, look at our strategy, it is up, um, as is our deck. So our deck is also up on the resources page. And this recording of the presentation will also be made available on the resources page. I want to note that um, we do have the French 
website that will be coming up. There's just a bit of a delay with translation, um, but that will be up by next week. So any um, Francophone attendees who are interested in that question, we will definitely make that happen as quickly as possible. Um, and I just wanted to end again, I think we mentioned a couple of times that we have a survey that we're sending out to everyone. Uh, we would love to have you fill that out and share information about where you're coming from and what you're interested in um, and in any feedback about the strategy we presented. Um, and feel free to share that survey to others as well. Great. Thank you. <laughs> So I think that's it. I think it's a big hawa, merci, miigwech, masli from us for uh, going the marathon with us on this long presentation. We, uh, we had a lot, we got so much feedback and uh, over the last six plus months. And so it's been a real journey to synthesize it and refine our thinking. And so we're trying to be as transparent as possible with you, show you our thinking so that you can help improve on it. So thank you so much for being part of today. Uh, pass it over to Jen. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. <laughs> Sorry, I was just typing a response to someone. Uh, yes, I guess echo all those sentiments. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Rich, we're excited to uh, continue the conversations. And yeah, just add my thanks to and, and looking forward to um, doing great things together. Great. So Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Au revoir, les amis. Au revoir. Bye-bye. You're muted, Jen. Cheryl, can you remember to just hit stop recording?